Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at the New Deal, a answer to how are we going to get out of the Great Depression. So let's get started. With the inauguration of President FDR, we see the New Deal goes into effect pretty quickly. He knew that people were scared. He knew that how bad the economy was in the depression. One in every four people was out of a job and there needed to be an answer of what's gonna happen. And he dresses it in his inauguration before he even left the Capitol building with the infamous, we have nothing to fear but fear itself speech. He got people realizing that any problem that existed could be tackled. We're going to have to work on it, but it can be done. One of his first actions <clears throat> is to, well, declare bank holidays. And four-fifths of all banking operations in the country came to a stop. And this was really pretty dangerous because Economic growth relies on money moving, and when money is not moving, you have to say, wait, how does this make the economy better? But giving banks a hold on all operations allowed for them to have a chance to recalibrate for where they were, what they had to do, and where they needed to be. In February of 33, Congress submits the 21st Amendment that will end Prohibition. The 18th Amendment created Prohibition. It made it illegal to make, buy, drink, or sell alcohol. But since it's a constitutional amendment, you need another constitutional amendment to replace it. That's what the 21st one did. The New Deal was a collection of different actions, policies, organizations, and endeavors to fix the economy. When Roosevelt looked at how bad things were, there were a couple approaches to how to fix things. If you gave all control of the economy to the state, you have created fascism and that would lead to hypernationalism and Nazism. If you give total control of the means of production to the state, you have created socialism. And one of the hallmarks of America being that you can make your own way in it would kind of disappear. The New Deal was meant to be a mix of both of these things. And Roosevelt relied on intellectuals, on social workers, on people who knew the systems to make it work. Fixing an economy this bad was not going to be just the flip of a switch. It's not giving everybody a check in the mail. There needed to be cuts and programs at the same time. And the Economy Act of 1933 reduced the salaries of federal employees and cut a lot of benefits for veterans. This was extremely unpopular, but when you have an economy that you need to fix, you have to cut spending. And this is the first step to doing so. Now, Roosevelt knew this was not going to be popular. And so he delivers the news by these fireside chats, these radio shows where he used the radio infrastructure to tell people, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. This is going to be the outcome of this. Roosevelt is really the first person to tackle a major communication system to address the nation. In this case, he did it with radio. To make sure that there were no further bank collapses, Congress is going to establish the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that says banks have to have a certain amount of money on hand. And in the event that they are that that money is interrupted, the cash is insured. This still exists today. So like if someone goes into a bank and robs the bank, the money will be replaced. The money for the accounts, it's still there. It's just, it's gonna take another day to get back, but it's still gonna be there. 
We also see that the homeowners loan corporation will be created. And the goal of this organization was to refinance people's mortgages, get people into buying homes, and even to make sure that foreclosing didn't happen. The National Recovery Act was a half a billion dollar relief act that created a bunch of smaller programs underneath it. And these were designed to give relief and aid to anyone who needed it. The Civilian Conservation Corps was something created by the National Recovery Act. And this organization gave men from the age of 18 to 25 forestry jobs, conservation jobs, planting trees, planting flowers, planting shrubs. This might be to beautify a national park. This might be to beautify a downtown area. But the point is, this is money that was available for these jobs. And if you had lost your job previously, this is a skill anyone has. Anyone can dig a hole and put seeds in it, dig a hole and put a sapling in it. You don't have to have the greenest of thumbs to do this. The National Industry in the National Industrial Recovery Act is also under the National Recovery Act, and this created the Public Work Administration so that your industries were going to have fair business practices. This is going to help your businesses get back to work, your factory workers get back to work. It's going to protect the minimum wage. It's going to protect the maximum hours, and it's going to give unions the ability to organize and bargain when either one of those is in jeopardy. The American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organization are going to come together at this time to work together. The goal of these two union entities was, as always, to do the best for the people. And they had grown during this time to be 9 million people at the start of 1940. A year into the New Deal, things were still, things were still bad. 9 million people are unemployed. Hundreds of thousands of those people are in real need of day-to-day -day help. And to help those people, we see two programs are created, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration and the Civil Works Administration. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration, FARA, created relief organizations themselves. It created charities. It made sure that food lines were moving. It made sure that food banks were stocked. The Civil Works Administration put people to work doing jobs. Now, this job might be repairing a road, pouring asphalt. It might be decorate the walls. It might be paint a mural. But it was a job, a job that you didn't have to be highly skilled in to do. Farmers had a real rough time following the First World War. And during the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl certainly didn't help farmers either. Being a farmer is never easy. And the Agricultural Adjustment Administration was an organization that was tasked with helping out the farmer. The AAA said that if you are a farmer and you grow certain crops, wheat, cotton, tobacco, pork, and a couple of their staple crops, if you are growing more than X amount of your produce is this, the government is going to give you some cash to help out. Going to help you with seeds and fertilizer, tools and manpower, anything that was needed. You had to make sure that you were producing at least X amount of this, but you're also not allowed to produce too much of it. If a farmer is producing lots and lots and lots of pork, then the price of pork will go down. So for farmers, it's kind of an interesting thing. If you have the ability to produce this much, then you can make money doing it. If you can't, then, well, if you produce too much, you're not getting any money. So 
unfortunately, there were some farmers who had to destroy part of their crop in order to have something that could work. The Tennessee Valley Authority was responsible for building dams and power plants and transmission lines, phone lines, telegraph lines throughout the Tennessee Valley, throughout rural A Appalachia. This is part of this country in the 30s that still didn't have electricity. They still didn't have, in some cases, running water. And this is how part of this country became modern in a very quick period of time. Three months after the New Deal had started, it was overwhelmingly popular because there was success. People could look at what was going on and they saw, yes, this system is working. There is economic recovery that's happening. It appealed to everyone. Your downtrodden, unemployed, and your, pardon me, bureaucratic individuals. Another one of the programs that we see will be the Works Progress Administration. This was a umbrella organization that gave money to people who are artistically inclined, people who are maybe willing to create a play or write a story, maybe someone who's willing to create art in some way. These people who might find themselves unable to create because of cash now had a way to create and still get paid. Some American authors during this time start writing with a proletariat style, with a Soviet style. They're mimicking, hey, wouldn't communism be grand if it was here? Hey, if the socialism was exclusive to this country, wouldn't that just be the best? And these books were extremely popular during the New Deal because the Great Depression didn't just affect the United States in a negative way. The Great Depression affected the whole world in a negative way. So for some people, being able to look and say, yeah, see, the system does work and it works right over there, got people to buy the books. Uh, two Americans, uh, most notable for creating a story in America at this time, uh, one was John Steinbeck. His work, Grapes of Wrath, talked about the Okies, the Oklahoma farmers who are trying to get to California and they're trying to get a new life. They want to be farmers. They want to be successful where they're going to be. And Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath is a great story of the time. And it is also a little long, admittedly. Uh, if you're going to read Steinbeck, I would recommend Of Mice and Men. Most people read it in high school. And it's about half as long as Grapes of Wrath and tells a pretty good story to boot. There were a couple of extremists who wanted to see the New Deal go in a specific way. And the first of these guys is Huey Long. He was a senator out of Louisiana. He was known for not calling out white supremacy, but he definitely treated African-Americans with contempt. Huey Long believed that there needed to be a share our wealth program where all the wealth, all the money that was created by working Americans would be divided among working Americans. This way, if you were, if everyone's working, everyone's getting paid. You're not going to see anyone super poor, but by the same notion, you're not going to see your super wealthy either. Charles Coughlin was a radio priest, and he believed that the dollar needed to get weaker. He believed that if the dollar was weaker, it would have a global impact. Things would get a little worse, but then we'd have a chance to kind of reset the value of all things. Now, as you can imagine, the idea of purposefully leading to inflation and purposefully weakening currency is definitely on the outsides of things. The last individual who we see in the extremist column was Francis Townsend. Townsend believed that we should create an old age pension program. 
that said all Americans, once they get to the age of 60, are given $200 a month. The condition is number one, you cannot work for that month. And number two, you have to spend all $200 in 30 days. The upside to this program is you'd have older people out of the workforce so that younger people who are unemployed could secure a job. And if that money is being spent, it will create economic growth. The downside to this is that it would cost a lot of money. It would cost $24 billion a year to keep this program going. Dr. Townsend's idea would eventually grow to become Social Security. And this was a system where citizens pay into a account over the course of their lives. And once they reach the age of 65, they can collect that money and live off it. This would encourage people to be working for longer periods, as well as when they are an older person, that it might be time to leave the workforce. In 1936, we see that FDR is running for re-election. The Republicans put up against him the governor of Kansas, Alfred Landon. Now, Landon was a follower of Roosevelt. He was an opponent of the KKK. He believed in regulation. He believed in the New Deal. But Roosevelt was so incredibly popular that he won every state in the nation except Maine and Vermont. That means that Roosevelt even won in Kansas, where Landon was the governor of it. After 1936, we see that there's a big change for how minorities are going to vote. After 36, and still through today, African Americans are predominantly going to vote on the Democratic ticket. They had been Republicans since Lincoln, but after this, this is where this group is going to consistently be voting. Throughout the first term in office, the Supreme Court really didn't do too much with the New Deal. There was only, only three justices who saw the New Deal as a good thing. The others thought this is just a passing fad, and that was at best. Some of them were outright against it. Roosevelt wanted to control the court, and this is where Roosevelt's power and fame kind of worked against him. See, as popular as he was, he thought that people would support if he started taking control of the Supreme Court. Being a Supreme Court justice is a real cushy gig. Once you're appointed it, you have that job forever unless you choose to retire or quit. You can do anything and there's, there's never a, you'll get fired for doing this thing. Roosevelt wanted to get more influence on the court. So he tries passing some legislation saying that if you were 70 years or older, you could retire. You could retire at full benefits. And if you don't want to retire, that's okay, but the president is going to appoint another justice. Ultimately, the idea of this is the president would be in control of both the executive and the judicial branch. And as popular as Roosevelt was, he thought the people were going to back him on it. And oh boy, howdy, did it not work. Uh, Roosevelt's uh, prestige as president would, wouldn't recover for another couple of years for this one. And after November of 1937, we see very little FDR legislation that gets passed. For most people, they viewed the, Revol the New Deal as something that had worked for them. For workers, it gave them something to work for. And we also see that there were people who were willing to fight against it too. In the General Motors plant in Flint, workers said they weren't going to leave, they were going to stay there and work. And when employers started to agree with this, Roosevelt doesn't intervene. The big impact of this is 
two, three years earlier, people would have been writing to have a job at all. Now they just don't want to leave the work. And this created a real question of how do we end the Great Depression? I mean, if the new, well, not the Great Depression, the New Deal, if we just flipped a switch and all these programs disappeared, would the work of them keep going? Would the economy keep moving? And there was a real question of this. And the agreement was you couldn't just turn off this support. In some areas, it had become the only thing to support the economy. And John Maynard Keynes' work in economics really talks about government spending and when it's too much and when you need to cut it back and what to do and how that works. If you have never taken an economics class, heads up, you're probably going to hear Keynes again. With all the spending that had happened because of the New Deal, we see that there is going to be some new changes for how work can happen, especially for kids. And that's the Fair Labor Standards Act. It would abolish child labor. It created the national minimum wage of 40 cents, and it said that anything over 40 hours a week is worth time and a half. The goal of creating these things is the businesses and corporations that were created by the New Deal could now move on their own. They didn't need New Deal money to keep them going. And if they agreed to this, then slowly the federal government could stop with the support programs. One of the big things we see, actually a couple of the big things we see with the New Deal is how women and minority groups were affected. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was kind of the face of the program for a while. She was the face for her president and she was it was her husband. So she was a political force to make sure all this happened. She get, makes sure that more women are involved in more programs. In African Americans, we see more and more are gonna be involved in the Democratic Party as well as the New Deal itself. We see that there are key cabinet positions which are gonna start going to African Americans. And even 10 years earlier, we wouldn't have seen that at all. And this isn't just in the political government, even the um, the CIO, the, corporate in, the corporation incorporated offices, a union that existed was accepting African-American members. Unfortunately, things for Native Americans had started rough and are slowly going to remain rough. By 1924, we see the first thing good for the Native Americans that has happened in a long time. Um, they are finally granted citizenship. If you remember through this course, if you remember through the Native American Wars, Citizenship was something kind of just always dangled in front of Native Americans as if you act good, you'll get this. If you act the way we want you to, you'll have these freedoms. This new laws that we see passed are going to do away with the Dawes system, do away with individual allotments and say that tribal governments will have their own power. So some people, some Native Americans would pool their land that they got from Dawes to create the tribal land again. And the old ideas came back. The old systems of governance were working. At the end of World War I, the United States did not want to get involved in another war. By 1935, we have passed a neutrality act that says we are not going to get involved in another conflict. We will not sell weapons to countries that are at war with each other. We did that in World War I. That's one of the things that brought us into the war. And then in 1936, another neutrality act was passed that said we are not going to even loan money to nations that are fighting each other. 
the nation was neutral. We were isolated. We did not want to get ourselves into another war. We just didn't realize that there was another war on the horizon. So today we took a look at the New Deal, at the impact that it had on American society. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.